Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about Cali Audio's SM5. These retail for about $1,700 each and were loaned to me as the pair by the manufacturer. I was not paid or given anything in return for this review. Couple specs up front, these are powered three-way speakers featuring a five inch mid-bass driver, a four inch mid-range and a one inch tweeter. Total power on board is about 150 watts. They use an XLR input and they are front ported. As you can see here, the design is a coaxial and it has the tweeter stuck inside the mid-range. So with a good coaxial, the mid-range is supposed to be the waveguide. And the other thing that I really like about this design is not only do you have the mid-range as the waveguide, the entire front baffle, look how large that waveguide is. Most of the time, what you're gonna see with the coaxial is the coaxial mid-range is just the waveguide. And, and listen, that works great and fine, but there are further ways to improve upon that and Cali's really done a great job of making the baffle the extension for that waveguide as well. Down here, you've got the five inch midwoofer and then the port. On the back, you've got all sorts of dip switch settings where you can set this thing up for boundary loading or desk or free field, whatever you want. And then you've got some system output volume control right here. And then the balanced input. Now these are the dip switches that you set to get all of these outputs. And for what it's worth, when I was listening, I played around with a couple of these like the boundary compensation, but for my actual test data, you're gonna see the full anechoic space response. And if I talk about room size, this is what I'm talking about. I like using the THX standard because it just makes my life easier and then I'm not making stuff up off the top of my head and having to defend why I defined it that way. Let's start off with the pros. The one big thing that this particular line of speakers from Cali offers is built-in DSP. So you can use free downloadable software directly from their website which will give you access to each speaker individually. If you wanna change around with the EQ, depending on where the speakers are positioned, or you wanna alter the sound of the speaker itself, not necessarily due to the room, then you have full range to do that. Another factor I like is that these are also wall mountable, which if you're in a studio space, or maybe you've got a smaller home theater type setup, you can use these and mount it to the wall, especially for front heights, rear surrounds, uh, the ceiling speakers, things of that nature. I think that that's a really nice feature that these speakers have. In terms of sound, the overall linearity is good. There are a couple little areas where maybe it's not quite so linear, but overall it's pretty good. These allow you to get down to about 40 hertz, 45 hertz in room. The directivity on these is quite nice as well with a broad radiation range horizontally, but also vertically. And that's really important for those of you who maybe don't have a lot of room or a lot of space on your desktop, you know, especially if you're using these for producing aspects where maybe, you know, you've got them set up on a console, but your ear is lower than the speaker. Now, ideally your ear should typically be on the axis of the tweeter with this particular speaker. Maybe you can go a little bit further off axis the side, like maybe five or 10 degrees and get a better overall response. And ideally you shouldn't be seated too far below that tweeter line, especially with most non-coaxial speakers. But with this particular speaker's design, the way the tweeter is mounted into the mid-range, giving you that coaxial effect and the overall enlarged size of that waveguide on the front baffle, you've got more vertical room to play with, which is a really nice feature to have. The only con that I really could find about this speaker is that it's just base output limited. Now, again, it does use a five inch mid base driver, so you don't expect it's gonna get a lot of excursion, higher output volumes, but it would be cool if it could go lower and if it could do it at higher output volume. So just keep that in mind. We're gonna show you some compression data in a little bit of two different variations. One where it's gonna be a quick swine, <laughs> swine sweep. Is that a pig sweep? All right, a quick sign sweep where it's just for fast transient dynamics. And then I'm gonna show you more of a long-term compression test where it's more indicative of the music that you're gonna to listen to where you may not have such compression, okay? So hang on and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now we're gonna move on to something that I've recently started doing, which are sound demos. So what I'm doing is I'm taking an original downloadable sound clip, I'm convolving the impulse response to the speaker, and then I'm loading that into the original sound clip. The idea here is that this is not a replacement for listening to these speakers on your own, but what it should do is give you a good idea of the overall tonality shift that the speaker introduces to the original recording. So when I play this, I'm gonna play the original and then the speaker and then the original and the speaker. And you're just gonna to try to see if you can hear a difference. If you can't hear a difference, that's a good thing. That means the speaker is doing a good job with this accuracy. If you hear wild deviations, which in some past examples that I've given, you can, 
then that means that the speaker is further away from accurate to the original source. So with that, what you probably heard is just maybe some base extension loss. You might have heard some little details in the upper mid range potentially missing, but you'd probably have to be straining to hear that. If you did though, there's a reason for it. And we're going to talk about that. This is the on axis frequency response. And this is what I convolved with that original recording. What we see here is that the original recording would have been shaped in this manner. So it would have rolled off the base at around 40 Hertz or so. The mid range would have been completely neutral. There might've been a little bit of a dip at around 80 Hertz. I mean, like one and a half decibel. In the upper mid range, there are a couple little areas of variation. And then this particular area around three and a half to four kilohertz, you might've noticed a little bit of lack in presence, maybe a little bit of lack of dynamicism in the original recording. But for the most part, I think that you're probably gonna be pretty dang satisfied with the overall tonality of that speaker and the fact that it didn't really change the original recording much. And then this is the CTA 2034 standard measurement. Same basic thing you saw a second ago with the on-axis response, but also I wanna point out the directivity looks pretty dang good on this speaker as well, which means that you can EQ this thing to your heart's content. And the cool thing is you don't have to use an outboard EQ processor, you can use the one that's built into the speaker. This is the estimated interim response. This gives you a rough idea of the sound that you would hear in various rooms. And this is also used via anechoic measurements using my Clipple near field scanner. So what it does is it takes 360 degree measurements and then it produces the on-axis response, the off-axis response, and the estimated interim response. Now this estimated interim response is pretty dang close every time to what I hear in my listening room, which is about 10 feet away from the speakers and the variation of the speaker from the back wall varies from like maybe a foot to three feet. I usually play around with that. This line gives me a rough idea of how I heard the speaker in my room. Now this is subjective. It's laying the subjective on top of the objective. This is the burst decay. We can see there's a little bit of a high Q resonance lingering around two and a half, maybe two and four kilohertz or so. Uh, these are not very strong. They linger a while, but they're not very strong in nature. We've certainly seen worse. This is the horizontal contour plot. Speaker's about plus or minus 55 degrees overall. And then vertically, you have about plus 50, maybe minus 40 degrees. So you can sit above the speaker and below the speaker with a wide range and hear pretty much the same tonal balance from these speakers. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels. Multitone distortion looks really good on the speaker. I'm stepping through the output from about 70 decibels to 79 and then 88 and then 96 decibels. So at the highest output at 96 decibels at one meter, you can see that the distortion in the mid range is really low. So this 3% is my personal bar. Anything below that is a good performing speaker. You have a little bit of a breakup right here around maybe three kilohertz or so, but I'm not worried about that. Plus that's also where the dip is. So this is relative to the on axis frequency response, which means that if there's a dip there, then the distortion is gonna be a little bit higher there because you're just taking the relative difference. And then if I look at longer term compression, and this is what I talked about earlier, this basically uses something like pink noise and it plays the speaker for about 30 seconds and it measures the compression artifacts of the speaker. I like using this because this is more indicative of how you're actually gonna hear the speaker, at least in terms of most music. And we can see from this, the overall compressions, maybe at about 0.75 decibels or so at worst around 150 Hertz. But then if I switch to my instantaneous compression, which gives me an idea of what is the dynamic range of the speaker, just like boom like that, or, or even faster, much faster than that. This shows us that the dynamic range is limited to about maybe between 96 and 102 decibels at one meter. But again, remember this is different than the compression I just showed you, which is longer term and it uses pink noise, whereas this one uses a sine sweep and not a swine sweep. Compared to the Kali IN5, we can see that the IN5 doesn't seem to react as strongly to my dynamic range testing, but at 102 decibels, you're pretty much done. So it's really not a lot of difference between this and the SM5 in that regard. If we look at the on-axis frequency response linearity, we can see that the IN5 overall is pretty similar. The main difference between the IN5 
and the SM5 is that the IN5 has some pretty serious diffraction issues in the higher frequency above about seven kilohertz. It's F3 and roll off is at about 45 hertz, F10 is about 39. So the roll off is pretty similar in terms of bass extension. Now, personally speaking, I think that what you're paying for with the SM5 is the wall mountability portion of it and the EQ. So the EQ is really gonna make the most difference in this speaker. And I think for those of you who are using this for any purpose really, are gonna benefit from tapping into the EQ ability of this speaker. But if we're talking just pure raw performance, I think that it's pretty even kill with the IN5. One speaker might do better than the other in terms of linearity or something like that. Uh, in terms of distortion, they're probably pretty similar, at least from what I'm measuring. But again, I think the major difference here that you're gonna get is that the SM5 has the built-in EQ DSP. And to me, that's a really very useful feature to have because now you can not only just adjust the speaker to your own liking if you want to, but you can adjust for the room issues. Typically they're gonna be below about 400 Hertz and they're gonna have very wild and strong deviation. So you're able to go in and remove some of the resonances that are caused by the room via the speaker, then that's a alternative, a good alternative possibly to having huge bass traps all over your room, especially if you have a smaller room. And that does it for this review. I hope you appreciate it. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, ask me in the comments section below. Uh, I'll answer what I can, but remember, I work a day job. If you'd like to support what I'm doing here, you can do so one of two ways. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, and there you'll get some behind-the-scenes information. You'll get to vote on things. My recent dust-up with another manufacturer, I had the community kind of give me a vote on how they think I should address it. So I really seek the opinion of my Patreon members for what I'm doing in the future. Uh, the other way is you can just use any of my generic affiliate links to Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, Newegg, Target. I think maybe I have a Walmart one in there. I, I would really appreciate that. Look, I quit doing standard affiliate links directly to products. And my hope is that maybe when you got to buy something from Amazon or Crutchfield, whatever it is that you'll remember, oh, Aaron has an affiliate link. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the due to solid. I'm gonna use that link and I'm just gonna buy whatever it is I need to buy. I would really appreciate that. That definitely helps me keep doing what I'm doing. and. Uh, yeah, I think I've said it all. All right, if you have any questions, let me know. I'll talk to you all later. Take care.